Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We are happy to have you join us for today's program. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. My name is Gary Sarkissian, and I'm the Director of Education and Content at CFA Society Boston. Today's program will kick off our four-part Distinguished Lecture Series that is brought to you through the partnership of CFA Society Boston and New Frontier Institute. Throughout this series, we will feature highly topical presentations by widely acknowledged authorities on issues of particular interest to investment practitioners. Today's program, which is titled Pension Lessons Learned from the Pension Crisis, will cover the economic health of the pension system in the US and how its current state could lead to systemic risk in our financial system. What was once an industry that regularly achieved surpluses in funding ratios just over two decades ago, the pension system today is suffering from a chronic shortfall in plan assets versus liabilities. Many experts would agree that factors that have contributed to this dire situation would include the quote unquote lost decade in equities, which notably spanned the dot-com bust and great financial crisis, low bond yields, courtesy of generous monetary policy, and out of control pension benefits. However, our speaker will also walk us through how pension accounting rules and asset allocation help the industry arrive at the situation it is in today. He will also discuss solutions that policymakers can implement to avert a crisis. Now I will turn the program over to Dr. Richard Michaud, who will introduce today's speaker. Dr. Michaud is president and CEO of New Frontier Advisors and a member of CFA Society Boston's Programs and Education Advisory Council, where he helped sponsor this four-part distinguished lecture series. Dick, uh, please take it away. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ron Ryan, a longtime colleague and a friend. Ron is CEO and founder of Ryan ALM. It's a bond asset liability advisory and bond index firm that produces, provides major financial indexes and strategies for pensions and ETFs. He is also well known as the founder of two additional firms, Ryan Labs and Ryan Financial Strategy Group. Early in his career, he was Director of Research and Strategy at, at Lehman Brothers and was also Head of Fixed Income at First Bank and Trust in Dallas. Ron has a BBA and an MBA from Loyola, Loyola University. Ron has had a long and distinguished career as an influential and innovative institutional quantitative strategist. His specialties include novel bond indices and pension fund management. He built the first liability index, which resulted in the Bernstein Fabosi Jacobs Levy Research Paper of the Year Award at the Journal of Portfolio Management. He also built the first liability hedge fund. In 2006, he was awarded the William Sharp Indexing Lifetime Achievement Award, and in 2011, the William F. Sharp ETF Product of the Year Award. He has a patent for his innovations in indices. He is the author of, of uh, the, the book, The U.S. Pension Crisis, What We Need to Do to Save America's Pensions. It's the uh, subject of this seminar. He holds a certificate of recognition for worldwide investment expertise. And beyond his accolades and achievement, achievements, Ron is well known for his great sense of humor, which you may get some sense of from some of the slides he will be presenting today. So take it away, Ron. Good afternoon and thank you, Rich. And thank you the CFA Society for allowing me to speak today. My topic is the lessons learned from the pension crisis. So let's go to the next slide, please. There is a cloud of uncertainty hanging over America's pensions today. Next. According to Milliman, corporate pensions had a funded ratio of over 120% back in 2000. And it has gone down now to 87.5% resulting in a deficit of about $212 billion. Next. Multi-employer plans have had a similar pattern. They went from 105% funded in 2000 down to 82% a 
and have a deficit of about 133 billion. Next. Public plans, the top 100. According to Milliman, the funded ratio went from 74.9% in 2018 to 66% in 2019, which is the largest decline ever recorded by Milliman for public plans. And it creates a deficit of $1.82 trillion. However, that's based upon a discount rate of about 7.25% under GASB. If we were to use the FASB discount rate of AA corporates, the deficit would grow to over $4 trillion. Let us pray. If TARP was a national emergency in our country at 900 billion, what do you call the pension crisis with these enormous deficits? Next, please. A good lesson can be learned from New York City employment employee retirement system, NICERS. I convinced Bob North, the head actuary, to calculate and show the market value of liabilities side by side with the actuarial valuation of liabilities. So in the year, fiscal year 2000, it showed that on an actuarial basis, the plan was 146% funded. On a market value basis, it was 120% funded. But watch what happens. In the year 2003, the GASB actuarial valuation would show a funded ratio of 124% when the true economic ratio, the market value ratio, was 64%. Wow. If I told you you were 64%, would you have a different asset allocation than if I told you you were 124%? I think so. Next, please. Pensions, unfortunately, have lost their shirts since 2000, and I'm sure some other things. Next, please. It's pretty apparent that pensions have been going down the wrong road for some time. And many, if not most pensions, are up to their neck in alligators. Next. Which led me to write this book on the US pension crisis, where hopefully I detailed the causes of this crisis and solutions. Next. I introduced Woody, the pension pencil, as the true villain of our story. It is, to me, Woody is the weapon of mass destruction. It's amazing what Woody can do. Uh, the accounting pencil, the actuarial pencil can do almost anything. You want a fully funded plan? Woody can do that. You want your deficits to go down? Woody can do that. You want your earnings to go up? Woody can do that. It is truly amazing what this weapon can do. Next, please. Well, because of this, it led to a disconnect of assets versus liabilities, where liabilities were actually missing in action and almost everything the asset side did. 
hard to find liabilities in asset allocation, in asset management, in performance measurement. Next, please. So the accounting rules, FASB versus GASB, are in most part inappropriate. And they lead to inappropriate things, especially GASB, which led to inappropriate asset allocation, inappropriate benefit and contribution decisions. I believe it all links. When you use a discount rate, that's not a market rate, not an economic rate. Uh, it inflates the funded ratio. It understates the present value of the liabilities. And it overstates the funded status, showing a lower deficit than the true economics. Uh, which causes a, a ripple effect. The asset allocation, instead of being based on assets versus liabilities, instead of focusing on the funded status, asset allocation focus on the return on asset assumption, because that was the discount rate for under GASB. And so what happened was under this GASB ROA discount rate, it showed higher funded ratios, higher funded status than the economic truth. So public plans in particular increased benefits when they thought they had a surplus, similar to what I showed you on NICERS. They thought they had a surplus when they indeed had a deep deficit. And then they reduced contributions for the same reasons. They thought they had a surplus. Two critical mistakes based upon inappropriate and inaccurate information. Next, please. Then in, in 2020 comes the coronavirus pandemic. And similar to an iceberg, we saw enormous number of cases and horrible deaths. But we most probably didn't see the other things that were happening. Uh, suicides, death of children, addictions, violence, heart failure, famine, the list goes on. Next, please. This led to, uh, as you can see here, a spike in the number of hospitalizations and deaths very quickly. Next, please. And it led to our economy being hit as we had the sharpest drop in GDP in history. Uh, fortunately, the quarter thereafter recovered a lot of it, but not all of it. But damage was done and maybe permanently. So, it wasn't completely repaired. Next, please. This is just another chart of showing the economy and then the sharp dip that we had. Next, please. And it follows that unemployment spiked to over 15%, perhaps the highest spike in America's history. 
Next, please. Which follows that we had business closures, some temporary and unfortunately some permanent. Next, please. Which affected spending patterns? You can see at the bottom, travel and restaurants were the hardest hit in credit card spending. Um, but home improvements and retail online actually improved because people were working from home. Next, please. All this led to a spike in bankruptcies, uh, which was a gradual upward trend. Next, please. The PPP came in to assist uh, and provided loans, which hard to say how good they were. Uh, and you can see that most of them were in the greater than $10 billion category. Next, please. Fiscal policy, the budget got hurt dramatically. Next, please. Federal deficit went wild and is continuing. Uh, the federal deficit as a percent of GDP is well over 100%. It's over 115%. Next, please. Money supply, the Fed came in to help out and supplied funds, uh, lots of funds. So we've had a dramatic influx of money from the Federal Reserve. Next, please. So what effect did all this have on investments? And I think the answer is volatility. So if we look at June 30th of 2020, you can see with the red numbers, we had negative returns in many asset classes. Uh, and if you look at the one year, most public pensions are on a June 30th fiscal year. So that would suggest that for that period of time, they had a pension asset return that was poor. At the same time, liabilities, whether you use the ROA, which doesn't understand volatility, it's a constant. And here I have seven and a half percent. Are you mark to market using ASC 715, which is the FASB methodology of AA corporate bonds as a yield curve? You have liabilities growing tremendously, perhaps 18.79%. So for the fiscal year ending June 30th, public plans got hurt. Assets did not grow like liabilities and created another deficit, just what they didn't do. Next, please. If we look at December 31, 2020, things got better most asset classes improved. Uh, and this will be mainly for corporations. Uh, however, 
if corporations are under the FASB, use an ASC 715, so they too most probably underperformed liability growth and had a hit to their financial statements. So the year 2020 most probably hurt pensions, especially public pensions with a June 30th fiscal year. Next, please. So volatility again was truly what happened in the coronavirus pandemic of 2020. Uh, assets grew around seven and a half percent and liabilities grew at double digits, which increased the funding deficit and increased contribution costs. As I wrote in my book, perhaps the real problem, the real crisis in pension land is the spiking of contribution costs. Uh, most pensions can't afford it. It was unexpected. Uh, my favorite was New York City, NICERS. This is kind of a believe it or not. In fiscal 2000, NICERS contribution cost was $68 million. Last year, the contribution cost was $3.2 billion. Wow. Everywhere I go in Pension America, I see a similar trend. The contribution costs have spiked since 2000. They're up five times, 10 times, 20 times. In the case of New York City, over 33 times. And it's unaffordable, unbudgetable. And therein lies the big crisis, spiking contribution costs. Next, please. The stock market, S&P 500, had volatile revenues, but they certainly went down during the pandemic uh, peak period, namely the second quarter of 2020, significantly. Next, please. Uh, net income followed, even though it came back a lot, it did not fully recover. Next, please. There is a difference between the NASDAQ and the S&P. The NASDAQ tends to have more high tech companies, which prospered during this period. Next, please. Dividends. Well, when income gets hurt, usually dividends get hurt and get cut. And that's what happened during this period. Dividends were cut, uh, perhaps at the highest level in some time. Next, please. Just another verification that the dividends have been going down. Next, please. This is kind of critical. Uh, most people don't seem to realize the power of dividends. Dividends reinvested have represented more than 50% of the growth of the S&P 500 for the last 40 years. So you want dividends, you want them reinvested. Next, please. Buybacks have been a big strategy used by corporations to enhance their stock prices. Uh, that got hurt during the pandemic. Next, please. P.E. ratios. 
The PE ratio is leverage. And it's currently close to the highest level of all time, but certainly in the last 50 years. That would suggest that stocks are perhaps overvalued. Hard to believe that you can sustain PE ratios that are historically high. Earnings would have to grow more and more and more. Um, so this is a warning sign. PE ratios are very high. Next, please. This is forward PE ratios. The last slide was current PE ratio. So even with forward PE ratios on forward earnings, we still have a PE that looks historically extremely high. Danger. Next, please. Warren Buffett has a Buffett indicator where he compares the Wilshire 5000 to GDP. It's at an all time high. Another indicator suggesting the stock market seems to be overpriced. Warning. Next, please. Yields on treasuries have been going down for a long time. My goodness, since 1982. If you can remember in 1982, long treasuries hit 14%. Um, this year, the yield on treasuries is going up a little, but the question is, is it a trend? Hard to say. But if you think inflation is going up, which most do, then you got to believe that interest rates are going to go up. Uh, and that would be good because liabilities, pension liabilities, should be priced as bonds, should be priced as a yield curve. So if yields go up, especially if you use the FASB methodology, then the present value of liabilities would go down. And this would enhance funded ratios and funded status. So we're hoping that this trend continues, that interest rates go up and help the funded status of pensions. Next, please. But given all this, there's a lot to think about or to rethink on what the hell happened to pensions since 2000. How did we get into this mess of tremendous deficits and tremendous spiking of contribution costs? What happened and how do we get rid of it? Next, please. Well, we're gonna have to break through old traditional thinking. We're gonna to have to come up with a logical, sound, prudent approach to pension investment. Next, please. Let's start at the beginning. What is the objective of a pension? Is to secure benefits in a cost efficient manner and to reduce risk over time. That's what a pension is all about. The lowest cost is when assets fully fund the liability so you don't have any extra contribution cost. The lowest risk is that when asset cash flows match liability cash flows. The problems is that usually assets don't know liability. Assets are usually not managed to liabilities. 
assets are usually not even measured versus liability. Strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. Next, please. Risk. Bill Shaw introduced his definition of risk back in the 1960s when he told the world that risk is the volatility of returns. I don't agree with that. I think risk is not meeting the client objective, the uncertainty. I had the pleasure to meet with Bill Shaw. He called me up and he invited me to his office at Stanford to spend the day. He enjoyed the work I did on a custom liability index, which he said clearly showed the efficient frontier. So I go to his office and I see the Nobel Prize and I congratulate him. And I asked him two questions. I said, Bill, you told the world the risk is volatility of returns. Help me out. Let's take a mutual fund or an ETF where the stated objective is the S&P 500. What would be the least risky asset I could buy for that objective? And Bill Sharp said, the S&P 500 as an index fund. I said, you're telling me that the three month T bill, which you cited as the risk-free rate would be risky with that objective? He said, of course, there's no way the three month T bill could consistently match the returns of the S&P 500. I said, my second question is, I'm in the pension business, liabilities are my objectives. Let's take a 10 year liability. What would be the least risky asset I could buy for a 10 year liability? And the Nobel Prize winner said, a 10 year treasury strip that would match that objective with certainty. I said, you're telling me the three month T bill would be risky? He said, of course, the three month T bill would have 39 reinvestment moments, 39 moments of uncertainty. There's no way the three month T bill could match a 10 year liability. I said, well, you get my drift. How could you have a generic definition of risk? It's based upon the objective. Well, three months later, Bill Shaw produces a white paper that I don't think anybody read, telling the world to forget the Sharp ratio and use the new Sharp ratio, which is based upon the objective. We call it the information ratio today, where the numerator is your returns versus the return of the objective. And the denominator is your volatility versus the volatility of the objective. Amen. Uh, I appreciate what, what Bill did. And he's right. That until we understand the objective and make it, I think, an index, a custom index, in this example, a custom liability index. I don't know how you can measure risk. I don't know how you can manage it without knowing how the objective behaves, how interest rate sensitive it is. So a custom liability index, as far as I'm concerned, is the first step to understanding risk or, and managing anything that's asset liability driven. Next, please. Absolute versus relative growth. 
the pension objective that so many pensions use who are under GASB accounting is an ROA, an absolute return target objective. And today, most are using 7%. Is that really the proper objective? Isn't pensions of assets versus liabilities? Isn't it all relative? And it should be relative in dollars, not percent. So the funded ratio and the funded status are meaningful, but it's the funded status that is the most meaningful. It's the dollars. Uh, so let's take a little example here. Let's assume you have assets of $60 and liabilities of 100. You're 60% funded. You have a funded status of minus $40. You have an ROA of 720. If you grew them both at 720, which is what GASB and the actuarial rules do, but that's hard to believe. They grow the liabilities at the same growth rate as the assets because they use the ROA as the discount rate for liability. Well, if you grow $60 at 720, you get $4.32 of dollar growth. If you grow $100 at 720, you get $7.20 growth. Which means the deficit grew. And now the funded status is no longer $40, but $42.88. Hopefully you follow that. It grew by 7.2%. So if assets were to achieve the ROA return, they would increase the deficit because liabilities are growing at 7.2% return. That's no way to cure a problem. That's no way to cure the funding deficit. You've got to look at dollars. You've got to look at the funded status, not the funded ratio. In order for assets to have the same dollar growth, the $60 of assets would have to grow at 12% to get $7.20 of growth, right? It's got the wrong hurdle rate, the wrong target. It doesn't have to grow at 720. It has to grow at 12%. If it doesn't grow at 12%, the deficit grows. And if the deficit grows, contribution costs grow too. It follows. So we have this game all confused. Uh, Confucius once said, given the wrong index objective, you will get the wrong risk reward. So in all the fortune cookies in Chinatown. Uh, but that's the moral of the story. We got the wrong objective. The ROA is not the objective. The funded status is the objective, dollars, not percent. Next, please. The Society of Actuary, Actuaries, God bless them, came out with a piece of research a while back titled Principles Underlying Asset Liability Management. In it, they said that accounting measures distort economic reality 
Amen. Entities who manage their assets based on accounting end up mismatching liabilities. Yes, just like I showed you. Entities that focus on economic value tend to achieve their financial objective. Hallelujah. This is beautiful. The translation of all this is asset liability management requires economic books. You need another set of books that mark to market your liabilities and assets and compare assets to liabilities on an economic basis frequently. So you know the truth. You need to know the economic truth in order to manage assets versus liabilities. That is missing. Without a custom liability index is the first step. I don't know how you could compare assets to liability. Next, please. There it is. Uh, if you know my background, I came from Lehman. I had many great years there. They were very good to me. I, I learned a lot. Um, and uh, I was the designer of the, the Lehman bond indices. We had several. And uh, my job was to help our clients understand and beat the Lehman indices. It was a great career. Um, I thank Lehman tremendously. Uh, but I left because uh, I wanted them to focus on liabilities. And I was told the magic words that made me leave. I was told, shut up, we're making too much money. So my conscience said, uh, I wanna do what's right for my clients and for the industry. So I left to start my own firm and began the, the tough road of assets versus liabilities on an economic basis. So I created the first custom liability index that calculates everything you would need for assets to understand and manage to liabilities. And it has to be custom because no two pensions are alike. They're like snowflakes, different labor force, different salaries, different plan amendments. It's impossible to have two pensions alike. Um, and once that's in place, you would think that the custom liability index would then be the benchmark for the asset side to function efficiently on asset allocation, asset management, and performance measurement. Next, please. I repeat myself, my kids have taught me if I don't say things five or six times, it just doesn't seem to enter the brain, so forgive me. Um, so the custom liability index should be the benchmark index and calculate everything you need. Whoop, you need to go back a little bit, sorry. Right there, that's fine. Uh, calculate everything you need, duration, market value, growth rates, interest rate sensitivity. Uh, it does it all. And the moral of the story is if you outperform market indices, generic market indices, but you lose to the custom liability index, didn't the plan lose? Of course. Next, please. Volatility. Most pension plans, most plan sponsors hate volatility. So how do we get rid of it or at least reduce it? And the answer is cash flow matching. 
cash flow matching is, is, is very old. In fact, it's most probably was the first way bonds were managed. We used to call it dedication, then defeasance. Cash flow matching should produce the cash flows needed to fully fund each and every liability chronologically. We think chronologically because the most important liability is the one that's due today. The second most important is the one that's due tomorrow. And the third most important is the one that's due after tomorrow. So we think that's the best way to reduce volatility and match liability chronologically. We think asset allocation needs to create beta assets. Beta by definition are the assets that supposedly match the objective. I asked Bill Sharp then, and he agreed with me. And I said, well, if the objective is liabilities, then it aren't the beta assets, liability beta assets. He said, yes. Um, so the liability beta assets are the assets to secure the benefits. Isn't that the objective of a plan to secure the benefits? And also to reduce volatility, reduce costs and volatility as side benefits. So if you matched chronologically, each and every benefit payment, you will reduce the volatility of the funded ratio, you will reduce the volatility of contributions. You are matched, cash flow matched. And by doing that, you also are buying time for the alpha assets, whose job it is to grow and grow and grow without being unencumbered. We don't need them to fund anything. What happens today is they take money from everybody. Why would you take money from performance assets to help fund benefits? As we showed you earlier, dividends are a major part of the growth of stocks. Why would you take their dividend income to fund benefits? You're greatly damaging their growth ability. Don't do that. Let the beta assets fully fund liabilities. Those are the bond assets. Next, please. Asset allocation should be based on the funded status, the funded ratio. If you separate assets into beta and alpha, liability beta and liability alpha, then the beta assets job is to match and fund net benefit payments. What are net benefit payments? It's after contributions. The alpha assets are allowed to grow without being uh, diluted. And we need a custom liability index to tell us how to build this liability beta portfolio. Next, please. I see I'm running out of time. We need the beta and alpha assets to work together. They're a team, not like this. There's supposed to be synergy. Next, please. So asset allocation should be based on the economic funded ratio, the market value of assets divided by the market value of liabilities. And we need a custom liability index to calculate that market value of liabilities. The larger the deficit, you would think the, the different the uh, asset allocation is. Asset allocation should be responsive to the funded status. A large deficit would have a different asset allocation than a small deficit. 
It should be responsive. Next, please. The liability beta portfolio should be the core. It's the bonds. The value in bonds is the certainty of their cash flow. They're not performance vehicles. They're not alpha assets. They're beta assets. Use them. Use them to cash flow match liabilities chronologically. And if you did that, the benefits are amazing. You will reduce risk. You'll secure the benefits. You'll have no interest rate risk because when you match benefits, you're matching future values. Future values are not interest rate sensitive. You just killed or neutralized the big bad risk in bonds. You reduce the volatility of the funded status and you buy time for the alpha assets to grow. Next, please, and I'll, I'll speed this up since we run out of time. Let's skip that one, go to the next one. Uh, problem, generic market indices. Most people manage money to generic market indices. Why? They don't look like your liabilities. In fact, they could send you down the wrong road. Confucius once said, given the wrong index, you're gonna get the wrong risk reward. Do not use generic in indices, use custom liability indices. Next, please. I'll try to stop here. It's all about cash flows. That's what this game's all about. If you had 50 million in bonds today at a 2% yield, it could produce 1 million in income. So if you had uh, liabilities of 1 million a year, you'd need a $50 million bond portfolio to produce the cash flow to fund it. But if you did cash flow matching, which includes income and principal and reinvestment, you only need $8.6 million to fully fund a million a year. Wow, what a difference. That's the way to do it. Cash flow match reduces the allocations, the bonds needed to fund those liabilities and does it with much more efficiency. Next, please. We've been asleep way too long. It's time to wake up. Next. We got to stay focused on the true objective liabilities. Next. We're not dead yet. There's still life. Next. God bless Pension America. Thank you for your time. Hopefully I didn't go over the time allotted. Thank you very much. Ron, uh, thank you very much for that uh, very informative and should I say entertaining presentation. The um, funny visuals help add some levity to a rather sobering issue and we appreciate that. Um, we'll try to discuss some methods uh, to dealing with this issue in this portion of the program. I know we're right at the one hour mark, so we'll try to be mindful of time here. Um, just as a reminder, everyone, we're going to turn the program over to Q&A, uh, in which you, the audience, will be able to interact with our speaker regarding today's subject. Um, as a reminder, everyone is in listen-only mode, so if you would like to pose a question to Ron, please use the Q&A button in your Zoom webinar window. We'll try to get through all of your questions as best as we can, just given the limited time that we have. Ron, I thought I maybe would open up with just the question that came in during your presentation, which to sum it up is, what is the solution? And I thought maybe it's a good segue now for us to talk about what policy uh, initiatives that you have worked on, namely the Butch Lewis bill uh, that has um, moved through the House of Representatives and I think is sitting in the Senate. Can you kind of walk everyone through the basics of the proposal and right. just, just to kind of uh, put it out there and put some context here, I think the solutions you talk about are just sort of where we went wrong. And if, if you were to start from scratch, these are the points you need to keep in mind. But right now there's a lot of plans out there that are, I guess we could say broken. So what does this bill propose and, and how does it work? Yes, the Butch Lewis Act was for multi-employer plans, but I think it's the model for public pension plans as well, maybe all plans. 
And the idea was to create a agency under the treasury to loan money to troubled pensions. You have to be in a critical and declining status, funded status below 60% with uh, not much hope of solvency. So what it does is it calculates the economic deficit of the plan and then provides a loan equal to that economic deficit. It mandates that the proceeds be used only to defease retired lives. You can only use bonds. It can only be a defeasance. It cannot go into the general asset allocation, which is what pension obligation bonds did in uh, one off the uh, objective. And by doing that, it's buy in time. And it's replacing the ROA with a low cost loan. It's going to be the 30 year treasury rate plus a little. So hopefully a, a loan at two and a half percent. So it's replacing the ROA of seven with two and a half. It buys time because the retired lives have to be defeased. Uh, and according to our calculations, by doing that, we have reduced the hurdle rate for the residual liability, which are the active lives and the POB bond by about 30%. So it, it makes everything much easier. We, history tells us if you're given time, equities and performance assets do better. Mm -hmm. So we're going to give them lots of time because we're funding the retired lives first. So the uh, re retired lives participants are now safe and secure. They're taken care of. And uh, we reduce the hurdle rate tremendously for the active lives. Um, we think that's the proper approach to, to funding trouble claims. So as you mentioned, and, and this, maybe this was my misunderstanding, this was geared towards multi-employer plans. But yes. now given what we've seen in terms of the fiscal impact that, that states have suffered, and now yes. we, we hear discussion of this, this new stimulus bill that will potentially inc incorporate uh, let's just call it for whatever it is, but bailouts, let's say for the states, is this going to be taken up a notch to incorporate those public plans, do you think? Or, or do you think it will just be focusing on, on just a multi- you got to believe the government's going to give a handout, but uh, uh, you need disciplines, you need rules. You can't put it into a general asset allocation and hope it's going to perform. Mm -hmm was the beauty of the Butch Lewis Act. It mandated that these funds can only, only be used for defeasance purposes to secure those benefits that they're taking care of. You can't go off and buy risky assets. That's not allowed. And that's what would happen. Uh, so uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a bailout for public plans, but I'm not sure it will have these features of, of defeasance and the discipline to do what's right, which is take care of retired lives. They're the ones that need it the most. They earn it. And uh, rank your priorities. The retired lives should always be the high priority. Gotcha. Okay, great. We'll uh, take a question here from the audience. Uh, George is asking um, about um, inflation. Several analysts expect both nominal and real interest rates to rise in the next 10 years. Does the prospect of unanticipated inflation change your analysis in any way? Do tips have a role in helping to solve this issue? Good question. Here's the problem I've been fighting for a long time. Pension inflation doesn't look anything like the CPI. Why pensions have an inflation strategy of tips or real assets or whatever makes no sense to me. 
if you want to hedge pension inflation, the only way to do that is the cash flow match the actuary's projections. Inflation is in his numbers. So if you match the liability payment schedule, you have hedged pension inflation. You don't need to do all that other stuff that is costly and has no correlation whatsoever. Take a look at any actuarial report and I bet you'll see something like they have salary increases of three and a half to five and a half percent as an assumption. Administration expenses of three to five percent as an assumption. Retired lives as a complicated formula that has, has it growing at some kind of cost of living adjustment. None of that is equal to the CPI. Uh, so why do anything with the CPI? Tips are very expensive. Just match liability payments and you have hedged the pension inflation by the actuary completely. That's the way to do it. Gotcha. Um, you know, just kind of, you're talking about matching a lot and, and based on the research you've done, based on this presentation, it's, it's clear that you're a big proponent of cash flow matching um, versus other forms of portfolio immunization. Could you maybe kind of walk us through some of the knocks you have against the other immunization strategies out there? Um, and, and are there ways that they would work in the pension industry or is it just industry specific that you believe get cash flow matching is the best approach? All right, well, I guess you're referring to duration matching. Yeah. And duration matching is mainly used by corporations uh, as a way to match the growth rate of liabilities on their financial statements. Uh, remember, duration is a present value calculation, which means it's extremely volatile. It changes every day. It's based on interest rates, right? Duration matching doesn't fund anything. Cash flow matching is the way to fund your liabilities with accuracy and economics. It saves money. Um, duration matching has a lot of problems. I put out a piece of research called the eight flaws of duration. If anybody wants to see it, it's on my website. Uh, but uh, it changes every day and you need to know what the duration of the liabilities are. Now, where do you get that? The actuary doesn't provide it. Somebody has to calculate it. And like I said, you're gonna to have to calculate it almost every day because it's changing. Here's, the, here's more. Duration peaks out at around 18 years. So liabilities are to be viewed as zero coupon bonds. That is the way the rules work. So if you have liabilities past 18 years, which everybody does, how do you duration match the 18 plus liabilities? Answer, treasury strips. Okay, treasury strips are expensive. They're the lowest yielding, right? Mm -hmm. Very expensive. If you did cash flow matching, you could go out 30 years with a 30 year coupon bond and cash flow match from 30 years on in. And by doing so, you will save lots of money. Usually, the difference between cash flow matching and duration matching is a cost savings somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 27%. That's a whopper. Uh, but they think they need to match the growth rate because there's a line item called actuarial gain of loss on the financial statements, which is the growth rate of liabilities versus the growth rate you forecasted. And that difference is a line item. So that's where duration matching is playing a role. Uh, but it comes with lots lots of uh, mathematical question marks. Uh, duration 
it was not easy to calculate. Uh, and uh, duration also is only a price measurement. If you had two bonds with the same duration, do you have the same return? No. They have a difference in yield, a difference in income. So there's a lot of factors. Bond math is complicated and difficult, but mm -hmm. matching is not the way to fund liabilities. It's a way to hedge liability growth, which is mainly operations. Well, what role, someone had asked a question in the chat, what role do uh, equities play in terms of funding liabilities? How would you, um, what's your perspective on that? The performance assets, the alpha assets, are the assets that should grow and grow and grow and be left unencumbered, right? And based upon the funded status, will determine how much you have in alpha assets. I'll give you Utopia. Back in the 90s, most pensions had a surplus. 120% funded was normal. Well, that 20% excess would have been a wonderful place to put alpha assets, right? Uh, on the other end, if you have a deficit today, you're 50% funded, pretty hard to make that up. So you want performance assets to help you make it up. But as they do their job, and grow and grow and grow unencumbered. You're supposed to port, it's called portable alpha. You're supposed to port the victories over to the beta side. So if liability growth of this year is 5% because interest rates went up and asset growth is 10%, why wouldn't you port over that 5% victory to the beta side so it could fund and match more and more and more of these liabilities to reduce and reduce and reduce the risk of this plan and reduce contribution costs and volatility. That's the way beta and alpha is supposed to get work together. They're a team. Help me fully fund this plan at low cost and low risk. So um, that's the way I see it. Uh, they're to help fund the plan, but they must port over the victory so beta can pay. I see. But doesn't pay. Beta pays the benefits. Gotcha. Um, aside from the argument that these accounting measures that you talked about uh, are detached from economic reality, to what extent do you view other factors such as the growth in pension benefits uh, as, a, as a major issue and contributor to the funding status? And that is today. Well, that was one of the major sins of the 1990s and early 2000s is as pension funds had a growing funded uh, status and real surpluses, they decided to do two things. One, they reduced contributions to the lowest level in modern history and two, they increase benefits. Now, if you have a good year, I can see giving a bonus, but I can't see giving an increased benefit for life. So when the bad times come in the future, you have no surplus, no escrow to use to help you out. Uh, that is not smart pension management. Mm -hmm. And pension management should be asset liability management. We're supposed to manage the liabilities as well as the assets. Uh, so annual bonuses, yes. Perpetual bonuses, no. And, um, you don't know the future and uh, you gotta be ready. You gotta have something in escrow or surplus. If you would use the insurance companies as your model, you have it, right? The insurance companies by law, NAIC, are required to be fully funded and have a surplus. And 
That's the way pensions should be. And the fully funded has to be 100% assets match the liability. They can't have risky assets in, in, that, uh, in that side. Gotcha. Why, why, we didn't, why we didn't adopt insurance rules, I don't know. Gotcha. I appreciate that. So um, we're getting close to the end of time here. So I'm going to kind of wind it down with a, qual- a couple um, policy related questions. And I hope you don't mind me, Ron, uh, to ask you, I know you're a fixed income and a defined benefits a- expert, but I hope you don't mind me asking you to wear a political hat uh, for these questions. But first off is just in terms of prospects for pushing any kind of um, policy tools um, into effect, such as this Butch Lewis bill, or maybe even something bigger that helps out the pension, public pension plans with the similar mechanism from this Butch Lewis bill. What are your thoughts as far as the prospects of this actually becoming law? And then um, the next question is just uh, more of more higher level. Um, Obviously, in the broad scheme of things, more companies today are using defined contribution plans versus defined benefit. Defined contribution, uh, that space has seen quite a bit of legislation over the years to help reform that and get folks to save more and retire. If you were, say, sitting on the Ways and Means Committee today, uh, what what policy initiatives would you put forth to help try to fill the holes in that that side of the retirement system? So it's a two two part question. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I I'm not a fan of uh, defined contributions. I see it as kind of a slap in the face to the employee saying, okay, the risk is now with you. (laughs) You decide asset allocation, we're not. Um, That's a tough one. I'll I'll go to the other side first. Uh, uh, Politics. The Butch Lewis Act to me would have been a great model for the pension world as always, the government comes in to help, right? You cry uncle, uncle comes in. And with the Butch Lewis Act, the way it was is, is the government has the ability to borrow money at the lowest cost of anybody maybe in the world. So they do that. They borrow money at a 30-year treasury rate and provide loans to troubled pensions with a small profit, but a profit. How many government agencies make a profit? <laughs> that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> that's a good trivia question. Uh, so the government makes a profit by charging a little arbitrage, a quarter of 1%, right? They borrow it 250, they charge you 275. What a deal, right? They put in rules and mandates and make sure you do this right, that you pay your bills, don't go off spend it on luxury items, spend on bills, benefit payments, get this thing corrected, and you buy time. History has told us that given time, uh, performance assets perform. So if we were to defease retired lives, we're gonna give the alpha assets 15 to 20 years to grow and grow and grow unencumbered that's a lot of time. It should grow nicely. And we're reducing the hurdle rate because we replace the ROA with the POB loan. So we took out a 7% ROA and we put in a 275 POB loan. That lowers the hurdle rate for the residual assets to perform. That all works. And we did all kind of analysis to prove it. And we had an actuarial firm check it out. So that works. Um, I, uh, I would think one of the things that they should do on pensions as they go through this 401k madness is uh, have an option that says you can have DB. You can have it back if you want it as an option. Mm-hmm. and force them into and put all the risk on the shoulders of the employees. Um, that's not fair. Do you see the annuities being as a stopgap? I'm not too familiar with the SECURE Act, but I believe it enabled um, 
insurance products to be offered through defined contribution. Do you see the insurance companies as kind of filling in that that yeah. middle gap? Yeah, annuities. Annuities make a lot of sense for people because it it kind of acts like a defined benefit plan, right? You know mm-hmm. what you get it for a certain period of time. Um, if there's a problem, they're expensive. But other than that, it's what people really want. They want to budget their life. That's what a pension I thought was all about. That I work hard and I can budget my life with this amount of money, right? Well, that's certainly not what a DC plan is where I'm gonna do asset allocation all over the place and I don't know what the hell's gonna happen. Defined benefit plans supposedly gave you a budget that this is what you're gonna get for the rest of your life and I can budget my life. So that has been killed if you go to a DC plan. Annuities help saying I can give you a budgeted amount for the rest of your life, that helps. So that's, that's a, on track, but it comes at a cost and you, you don't get as much as you would with a defined benefit plan. So there has been a, a sacrifice of cost, but uh, um, it's a shame. Defined benefit plans should not go away. They just should be run correctly. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Great. Well, we're uh, near the end of time here. So I wanted to just uh, give it back to you uh, to make any final comments here. Are there any final parting comments you would like to give to the audience? Okay. Uh, When you look at a corporation, an individual, uh, the largest part of their budget is usually some kind of debt, right? And uh, that should become the high priority is to rank your priorities and you wanna get rid of your debt is the first priority. And uh, I always see it as a triangle where the base or my necessities, you must take care of your necessities. And the necessities are your cost of living I see pensions as part of that cost of living. Make sure that is taken care of. So if you need $100,000 a year to live, make sure that's taken care of some kind of way with the least amount of risk and the least amount of cost. That to me is what a pension is supposed to provide, but what it, but what it doesn't, you have to fulfill it. Um, I just wish we would address the pension crisis in America. It, to me, is the largest crisis, financial crisis since the depression, right? We have over $4 trillion in pension deficits in America. Please help us out of this hole. And I think the Butch Lewis Act model is a wonderful way to do it. The government loans money at government rates plus a little, mandates that you do it right by defeasing and you buy time. Yeah, I think the government needs to step in correctly to help pension America. Um, Because if pensions go down, what's gonna happen, right? Won't be pretty. No. Won't be pretty. I, I, I think it's the basics of America living is the pension. So, yeah, it's a big problem gotcha. that few people seem to want to address. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Um, this thank was a you. very informative presentation. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, remember to w- visit our website, cfaboston.org, uh, to see the upcoming events. Uh, we have three more parts to go to our Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, part one was today. Um, so look forward to having you join us for those upcoming events as well. Uh, and until then, please be well. Thanks, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, CFA. Thank you.